So good evening everyone, welcome to this special ATG members event uh, with the cast of Rosmazol. Um, my name is Matt Truman, I'm a theatre critic and in my view you're doubly lucky tonight. Not only because your ATG membership gets you closer to the action, but also because I think you may just have seen one of the best shows of the year so far. Start me off, Rosmazol's not seen that often, why? Great question. <laughs> because people can't pronounce it, <laughs> I think. It, yeah, it's the... Well, if Ibsen's considered the, the second most performed playwright in the world after Shakespeare, why do people not really know this play? I, I wonder if it's partly to do with the translation. People that I've spoken to who have seen previous translations of it had kind of felt that this helped to unlock a little bit of the, the spirit of it and what kind of Ibsen's sort of kind of understanding of the world aside from just this kind of domestic, naturalistic parlour drama. Mm. What about this, this set as well? I mean, it's such a striking room to be in. And obviously the title of the play is This Place. What is it to, to play off the walls and the lighting? You feel that, if, that he's written that the house is very much a character within the play. And so to have a, a, a room that has so much to it that you can kind of feel is a real place, is, has been lived in and things have happened here. So it, it very, it's great. One, being in the rehearsal room was one thing, but sort of coming in here and you could sort of feel the floorboards and feel the wood and it feels like an old house. Mm. It feels very much like you're in an old lived in place. So it's great, it's great to perform in. Ray Smith had designed it so that um, there's no ceiling. So in the pictures, it, she was saying it looks like you're in the bottom of a grave. You're kind of looking up at the, the earth above, which had kind of this sense of this house having a force and like, yeah, power over the characters. It, hol it holds us captive. And will it, will it retain its power over everyone? Or is this, gonna, is this old world gonna crumble? That word, old world, and Giles, you used the word the old house as well. Obviously, you're, you're all dressed in period costume, and yet there's something very immediate and fresh about the performance style. What was it to find the balance between those two things? I, I love this about this play, is that we are in period costume in a very um, accurate, authentic period set, but it's like we're, we're doing a new play at the Royal Court. But mm. that is what it would have been like when Rosmus Holm was first performed. It's almost like, um, it makes me think of you know, Shakespeare's original designs or settings. It's like, it's just a quick statement. It's like, okay, we're in that era, forget about it. Mm. Now we get on with the reality of the relationships. And the... I'm interested though in what Duncan's done with it. You've talked about the modernizing of the language, but also Tommy, you're talking about the kind of the freshness of the ideas, the confusion that, that feels very contemporary. Has playing this play for the last two months and rehearsing it, has it given you a way of looking at the world and what is going on at the moment differently? Has it changed your sense of where we are? This, the, the feeling, the atmosphere in the audience <clears throat> feels very in tune with what's, what we're saying and what's happening for them and what's happening for us as a country and as a world. And then, you know, to say, with everything that was happening in Al Alabama, then to say, all I've yearned for is to have dominion over my own thoughts, my own body my own future. That, that takes on you know, the, a different sort of weight to it. Mm. It's, no, it's not just about the character in this particular circumstance. It's something universal, something very important to a lot of people, to me as well. You stand on that stage and you speak her words for yeah. real, right? Yeah, well, it, it feels, you know, to, when she says, you know, I have no to have the self-awareness that she had to say, I have no vote, I have no status, I have no wealth of my own. She knows what she, what she doesn't have, that written at this time in, in 1834, saying those things, which feels a conversation she would be having with women today. Uh, it, it, it lends a different kind of weight to, I think, and significance I feel very um, stimulated by. Mm. Tom, John's almost the, the other side of that coin. How do you as an actor, find the drama in that kind of passive back-footedness? Well, I think he's uh, on a precipice all the time. He just senses the violence of, any, of moving in any direction, that everything has consequences, radical or conservative, left or right. 
And I think Rosma just wants everybody to stop, to stop with their own agenda, because there's always victims. So I don't see him as uh, on the back foot. I see him as deeply principled. I was thinking about Ian as director uh, before coming in, actually, and thinking, if you think a lot of his work, he works with very big casts, and there's something symphonic about the way he works with companies, it seems to me. And I wanted to ask Peter and, and Lucy, you're, you both have slightly different challenges in that your characters are either quite silent a lot of the time and watchful or don't appear that often on stage. And it, is there a different skill in that challenge? Um, well, very specifically, I think for Mrs. Helseth, uh, I think with a character like that, you have to have a very solid backstory in your head. So you're carrying a world with you. I mean, I think Peter does that so extraordinarily as Brendel. And, and so you have this whole person with you the whole time. I always think of Ibsen, like Arthur Miller, like one of those playwrights who build like a carpenter. Good, solid planks and balances and... And then Brendel, it's as though he chucks in a grenade, <laughs> you know? I mean, that's kind of was my image. So it's a, it's a kind of wild energy about him that's great fun to play. And uh, yeah, the, the key is just to imagine his whole life. And then he brings like a thousandth of that on, mm. but he's fed the flames by all the stuff you've imagined him doing, yeah. Let's turn it out to you guys. Uh, yes, just in the, what, fourth row. Obviously, Beth is a huge character in this play. You never see her, you never hear her, but she's spoken about a lot. And I felt watching it, I felt, weirdly, her presence a lot throughout the play. I think, obviously, it's largely down to the writing that she feels so present, but I think you guys really, really brought her to life. And I was wondering if there was any prep you felt you had to do going into this play in terms of creating a backstory, mm. just stuff like that, if there was anything like that to make her feel so real. Yeah, Ian, in rehearsal with all of us, did lots of improvisations. In fact, we had um, Monique, our assistant director, sometimes she would stand behind me and every time I talked about Beth, she'd just put her hand on my shoulder and to go, I'm here. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it, it was, so useful to me as an actor to, to feel the presence of someone who had informed so, met, so much of who Rebecca was and why she was still there and why she'd come to the house anyway. And I felt that that's what Ian did so, so beautifully. It gave real respect to the people who had helped to create the world that these characters were now inhabiting. But also the, the political ghost story that is the, the kind of past making itself felt again. These, the way these ancestors yeah. just light yeah. up is really fascinating yeah. as well. That was a great question. Thank mm. you very much. Yeah. When I saw it, I mean, it was a play that I didn't know. I'm one of those people who can't pronounce it and didn't know what was coming. And that feeling that you both kind of go with it and go with it, go with it, and then it ends so surprisingly, and yet the only place it feels like it could we, we, we have a, a different ending, don't we? That we, yeah. we sometimes think that it would be great if when I come on and go, Miss, it's time, I've got a suffragette sash <laughs> on, and, and I've got my own suitcase and, and we, we go, go off into we the go carriage off and we run a business in the, in, in the city. Yeah. So, you know, that's, that's going on as well. Yeah. <laughs> I might just leave them on the bridge yeah. to contemplate things. Yeah. Right, there you right. go, John. See you I'm later. just off with Mrs H. We're, we're off to, you know. Have any life. <laughs> yes. Having found the hope in that ending, <laughs> then, um, I think it's time to, to wrap up. But uh, if you'd all join me in thanking Tom, Lucy, Hayley, Giles and Peter.